Welcome to all of you, those of you who are here in body and those here in spirit. Even and especially if you feel like your spirit hasn't quite caught up yet, like you're not quite here, you're not quite ready. But ready or not, it has begun. Christmas is here, and we are here to celebrate, to rejoice, to ponder all these things in our hearts, to worship. Let's pray. You who are beyond our understanding have made yourself understandable to us in Jesus Christ. You who are the uncreated God have made yourself a creature for us. You who are the untouchable one have made yourself touchable to us. You who are most high make us capable of understanding your amazing love and the wonderful things you have done for us. Make us able to understand the mystery of your incarnation, the mystery of your life, example, and doctrine, the mystery of your cross and passion, the mystery of your resurrection and ascension. On this Christmas Eve and always, Amen. Each year, the child is born again. Each year, some new heart finally hears, finally sees, finally knows love. And in heaven, there is great rejoicing. There is a festival of stars. There is celebration among the angels. For in the finding of one lost sheep, the heart of the shepherd is glad. And Christmas has happened once more. The child is born anew, and one more knee is bowed. love stories, all kinds of stories. Stories are one of the best ways to learn concepts, to understand each other, to understand ourselves. Stories strike us all in different ways, different parts of the story speaking to different parts of us. 
And the Christmas story, oh yes, the Christmas story is one of our favorite stories as Christians. This is the story that makes God loves us understandable and real. It's a story of many parts. A story about hope, faith, joy, peace, and victory. A story of joy and light. A story about peace and struggle, about hope and love and faith standing in victory over discouragement and darkness. We've told this story in parts over the last four weeks as we've lit the candles of the Advent wreath and talked about their meaning. And we are going to retell the full story here tonight. The question is, where does the story actually start? We could start in the stable, but for the stable to make sense, we need Nazareth. For Nazareth to make sense, we need the prophets. And for the prophets to make sense, we need to start at the very first prophecy, at the very beginning. Genesis 3, verse 8 to 15. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Genesis chapter 22, verses 15 to 18. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Isaiah 9, verse 2 to 3 and 6 to 7. The people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with the righteousness. He will judge the needy with justice. He will give decisions for the poor and the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little, little child will lead them. O come, O come, and be our God with us, O long-sought witness for a world without. 
O secret seed, O hidden spring of light, come to us, wisdom, come, unspoken name, come, root and key and king and holy flame, O quickened little wick so tightly curled, be folded with us into time and place, unfold for us the mystery of grace and make a womb of all this wounded world. O heart of heaven beating in the earth, O tiny hope within our hopelessness, come to be born, to bear us to our birth, to touch a dying world with new-made hands and make these rags of time our swaddling bands.
The Christmas story, our story, is one part faith. Welcome to Nazareth, a long way from Bethlehem or anywhere. Welcome to a home like any other. Here we see a teenage girl. Not much to distinguish her from any other girl, except God has chosen her. And the angel comes to her, and does he tell her what will happen, or does he offer her the opportunity? Perhaps it doesn't matter, because in faith, she says yes. And in faith, she sings a song about what the world will become as a result of this moment, this yes, this sign that God is fulfilling the prophecies, the hopes and dreams of all people. Luke 1, verse 26 to 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I'm the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Finally, there came a time when love spoke again. A word from eternity. A word spoken to a girl who belonged to a people not known by the world. Spoken to a girl who belonged to a family not known by her people. To a girl named Mary. And all creation awaited in hushed silence for the girl's answer. And Mary spoke her yes. And love watched over Mary. And so there came a time when love breathed again. When love breathed new life into Mary's yes. And a new day dawned for the world. A day when light returned to darkness, when light returned to dispel death.
story, our story, is one part joy. We know this part. We love this part of the story. After the nine months of pregnancy, after the journey to Bethlehem, now finally, the baby is here. Such joy. Here and now, all the difficult parts are forgotten. Never mind the long wait, never mind the pain and exhaustion of labor, never mind the strange surroundings. All of that is lost for a time in the joy in this miracle moment of meeting your child face to face for the first time. He's safe, you're safe, everything's good. And then the angels sing, and then the shepherds come rejoicing, and we're with the angels bringing the good news to the world. And we're with the shepherds, almost unable to believe, not just that God has come, but that we, the shepherds, smelling of campfire and sheep, we are being invited by angels to see him, to see the Messiah, us see him. And we are filled with joy. Luke 2, verse 1 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there's no guest room available for them. Luke chapter two, verses eight to 18. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off 
and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Blue homespun and the bend of my breast keep warm this small, hot, naked star fallen to my arms. Rest, you who have had so far to come. Now nearness satisfies the body of God sweetly. Quiet he lies, whose vigor hurled the universe. He sleeps, whose eyelids have not closed before. His breath, so slight it seems no breath at all, once ruffled the dark deeps to sprout a world. Charmed by doves' voices, the whisper of straw, he dreams, hearing no music from his other spheres. Breath, mouth, ears, eyes, he is curtailed who overflowed all skies all years. Older than eternity, now he is new. Now native to earth as I am, nailed to my poor planet, caught that I might be free, blind in my womb to know my darkness ended, brought to this birth for me to be newborn, and for him to see me mended, I must see him torn.
The Christmas story, our story, is one part peace. The angels promised peace on earth and goodwill to all. All, just like God promised Abraham. And then... Along come the wise men who extend our definition of all. Not just all the people who look like us, all the people who think like us, all the people who believe like us. The shepherds aren't all that high class, you know, but they're still our people. Nope, it's the foreigners. The people from another religion. The ones who don't look like us. How did they get here? Something about a star? And they have traveled a long time, restless, looking for a new king whose appearance shakes up even the order of the stars in the sky. And now here they are, here we are. We have found the child with his mother. Now our journey comes to an end. This is where we find peace. And then we find that God is extending or possibly changing our definition of peace as well because the peace the world gives is not to be found here for long. Herod is angry. Jesus' life is endangered. And as a result, the family must become homeless, refugees in Egypt. Even the Magi returning home must have found that their old way of life did not fit them anymore changed as they were by their long travel and their encounter with God. This is not what we thought peace would be. But God is here with us. The world does what it wants, but within it still, we have peace. Matthew 2, verse 1 to 15. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We we saw a star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. This was the moment when before turned into after, and the future's uninvented timekeepers presented arms. This was the moment when nothing happened, only dull peace sprawled boringly over the earth. This was the moment when even energetic Romans could find nothing better to do than counting heads in remote provinces. And this was the moment when a few farm workers and three members of an obscure Persian sect walked haphazardly, by starlight, straight into the kingdom of heaven. I heard the bells on Christmas Day Play. And why? 
And the Christmas story, our story, finally is one part victory. You can see that as we stand here in this moment looking out. On the one side, we look back to the first promise we were given to that first hope. And on the other side, we look forward to the death and resurrection of Jesus, which makes our salvation possible and complete. In this moment, we balance both those events, and we know victory over sin has been, or will be, or is being given to us, gifted to us. But also, in this moment, if we look at just this moment, God has transcended the barrier that evil built of our actions, the barrier that kept us away from him. But it wasn't by pulling us to God's side of the barrier. No, it was by lovingly, voluntarily coming to our side of it, coming to us, to live life with us, to redeem daily human life and make it holy because God is in it, to translate the love of God down into terms, into actions and words that we can understand. This is the victory. This is the light. The word has become flesh and is living among us, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Look how long the tired world waited, locked in its lonely cell, guilty as a prisoner. As you can imagine, it sang and whistled in the dark. It hoped, it paced and puttered about, tidying its little piles of inconsequence. It wept from the weight of ennui draped like shackles on its wrists. It raged and wailed against the walls of its own plight. But there was nothing the world could do to find its freedom. The door was shut tight. It could only be opened from the outside. Who could believe the latch would be turned by the flower of a newborn hand? child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping who made angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping hopeless and Strength, strength, strength.
As a benediction, here is the closing of a letter sent Christmas Eve, A.D. 1513. There is nothing I can give you which you have not, but there is much that, while I cannot give, you can take. No heaven can come to us unless our hearts find rest in it today. Take heaven. No peace lies in the future which is not hidden in this present instant. Take peace. The gloom of the world is but a shadow. Behind it, yet within reach, is joy. Take joy. And so, at this Christmas time, I greet you with the prayer that for you, now and forever, the day breaks and the shadows flee away. Amen and Amen.